All right. So a quick background on Art Synergy. About, well, th almost three years ago now, the National Endowment for the Arts awarded the City of Montpelier $50,000 as part of what was proposed as a $150,000 project to create a master plan for public art for Montpelier. And the master plan for public art in the NEA's lingo and in, in the field is a very specific policy document that the city adopts to help drive their planning uh, going forward. And so we wanted to bring the community together around a discussion of what kind of public art we want in Montpelier, how that public art can inspire community connectedness and vibrancy and growth, and then to propose a structure and a funding mechanism that the city would adopt to help make that a reality. And so since last fall, we've been having a series of workshops, different types, uh, teaching artist residencies, gallery spent 10 days at the middle school, and some of you may have seen the installation they did in front of City Hall uh, with the beautiful wooden mills and whatnot. That was galleries and the seventh graders? Seventh, yeah. Seventh grade team. Uh, we've had several visioning workshops uh, of different types to capture ideas of where public art could go, what type of public art people are interested in seeing, and also just kind of uh, an information <coughs> sessions to explain just what we mean by a public art master plan. And so we're lucky to have tonight some spokespeople to share their ideas about public art. And uh, Michelle is kind of my co-anchor, and Michelle runs the public art program for the state. Mm -hmm. Is that the best way to summarize that? Sure, yes. There's okay. a, a couple of different programs around that, so um, for permanent installations and for communities. So. Great. And so uh, one thing that, that this master plan for public art is not is a cultural plan. And so I've asked Michelle to talk just a little bit about the difference between a cultural plan and a master plan for public art, and so we can start getting that distinction. Because when we pr propose the policies to the city, they'll be very, very narrowly written about supporting public art and investing in public art and specifically not a broader cultural plan right now. So we want to be sure as we go forward we understand what that is. So the plan for tonight is Michelle's going to talk just a minute about that, and then one at a time Sarah and Gallery and Lars will present just, uh, I, I told them it was like speed dating. I've asked them to do the worst thing possible. I'm actually going to clock them and time them, and, and I, look, I have my five minutes, you get your half, halfway through sign. I'm, I'm, I'm bad, I'm bad and good about this. Uh, but uh, everybody gets about 10 minutes to talk about a particular issue and set up some ideas for then us to talk about and throw out questions, and this is really a free for all. So we'll have about 10 minutes after each presentation to talk, and then we'll have a challenge question for everybody to complete after each presentation, okay? Any big questions before I hand it over to Michelle? All good? Ready, set, go. Well, my presentation is really short. It's just uh, to kind of give you a little context that in some of the conversations I've been involved with with Paul, uh, sometimes they go down roads that really aren't exactly what a public art master plan so is. So a cultural plan uh, for a city or a town or some a place might involve much more mapping of cultural assets, looking at programming, the creative economy stuff, quality of life goals. Um, it's a much broader look at how a town or a city or region wants to support its cultural endeavors. Whereas in a public art master plan, it's really much more about identifying specific locations, looking at public art policies, funding strategies, uh, commissioning mm -hmm. uh, processes, those kinds of things for public art. Now public art can be temporary as well as permanent and temporary can include many art forms. It doesn't necessarily have to be all visual art, but there may be some spaces identified in this plan that might be places where people can encourage activities and programming um, 
as well as temporary installations. So we do want to think broadly when we come to the temporary pieces, but for permanent installations, there may be ways that you can get funding um, and think about the private development as well as the public possibilities. So it's really more about physical place right now. So public art can be one part of a bigger cultural plan, but for the purposes of what Paul and his group is working on, it's it's pretty specifically defined. So, does that Perfect. sound right? Yeah, okay. and that inspired me just to uh, add a little uh, more background about Art Synergy. So the, the kind of the governing or the, the steering committee around this uh, project includes myself, uh, Kevin Casey from the city, and the executive director of Montpelier Alive, who uh, for a while was Ashley Witzenberger, but they're in transition right now. So that team was really the, the leadership team that applied to the NEA. And the type of things we'll be uh, presenting to the city will be uh, include a governance structure of, of a, what, what type of group of people we want to have come together to manage the public art uh, program for Montpelier. And so there are different options there. There's a steering, uh, an advisory team that's come together to help uh, with, uh, to go through all that. And, and so this is part of collecting those ideas so we can add your voice into that public plan and, and be sure that Montpelier is really represented. Okay, so we're going to start with Sarah, who's going to talk a little bit about what's happening up in Burlington. And so, uh, take it away. Okay. Um, yes, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a piecemeal uh, perspective, on, or a perspective on how we piecemeal our public art program together over a number of years. Um, so Burlington City Arts is a department of the city of Burlington, but um, we actually fundraise or earn 60% of our budget and function more like um, a nonprofit municipal hybrid. Um, so we established a formal art program by resolution of the city council in 1991 called Art in Public Places. And then soon after spent the next uh, period developing guidelines for commissioning and accepting public art on city property and outlining a percent for public art policy. While the guidelines were accepted in 1999, the mayor felt that the percent for public art resolution was too risky to put forward to the city council at the time and preferred instead to try for a voluntary approach to commissioning public art. And a percent for art program was not passed. So for several years, BCA worked in partnership with city entities, primarily the airport, um, and private developers to commission public art and advocated for the inclusion of public art in city projects, but in most cases, the public art components were value engineered out. So BCA was also simultaneously developing um, other temporary art in public places projects in the city firehouse gallery, which some of you may be familiar with, and activating public spaces uh, by programming concerts, festivals, and ongoing events like the Artist's Market on Saturdays in concert with the Farmer's Market. These projects could be developed and executed much more quickly and less expensively than permanent public art projects. It got money into artists' hands quickly, created popular community gathering events, and were fairly easy to fundraise for, which was important to us as a fundraising organization. Because we did not have this funding stream for permanent public art without a percent for public art program, and then the recession reduced private and public capital spending by quite a bit, Permanent public art became less of a focus for Burlington City Arts for a number of years. But now, 10 years, um, we have a 10 year capital plan in place in the city of Burlington for the first time. <laughs> I know that's crazy, big city. And a mayor who's eager to really dramatically improve the built environment. So there's renewed interest in commissioning permanent public art in the city. With the impetus not so much coming from Burlington City Arts, who you know, used to be pounding on the door every day to try to make this happen in the old days, but it's really coming from other departments who are inspired by what other cities have done in other parts of the country in transportation projects, parks, uh, infrastructure and public spaces through public art. And they're looking for a roadmap to do the same kind of thing. And a percent for art pro program could really outline that. So once again, we are working to advance the percent for art program with the mayor's encouragement. Permanent public art is an exciting symbol of the kind of collaboration a city is capable of. It can represent the unique, uniqueness of a place and contextualize it within the world. 
and it can provide a platform for vital and sometimes controversial discussions that lead to potentially stronger communities. And I am referring to a very specific mural in Burlington. <laughs> 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 However, it is also a time-consuming and bureaucratic process. I often imagine what BCA would have been like if we were successful in our first attempt to pass a percent for art program, and it's likely that we would have spent a lot of resources developing a handful of permanent public art projects. Some of them would have been great, and some of them maybe not as good. Rather than building the many programs and temporary projects that have become part of Burlington's creative landscape, and that support hundreds of artists every year through teaching, exhibiting, and performing opportunities. So now we are at a point where the professional and grassroots arts community has grown and BCA is a more mature organization, deeply integrated within city government and community processes, and in a much better position to revisit what it will mean to manage a percent for our program in the city of Burlington. That's it. And my question, do I, do I pose that now? Or does everyone know this or no? Do you want to, did you want to use any of your images? And also before we oh, go I further. Oh, just running behind me, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, do you, in case people don't know what a 1% uh, program is, give us a, a description of what that means. Yeah, so different cities um, use percent, or implement different percent for our policies. But generally what it is, is it's, is it's a policy that, um, takes a percent of a capital budget and sets it aside in a fund for public art. And it can only be used for um, public art as defined by whatever that, that policy um, includes. So the percent for art resolution that we are proposing at the moment is a percent of the city's capital fund, so the annual appropriation for anything that's invested into um, the capital budget um, would be, a percent of that would be, would be put aside for public art. And then the way that we're planning to word it, I think, is that in addition to that, city departments would also look, do their best to find other sources to um, meet a percent of the project, but it wouldn't be, it's not gonna be a requirement that it's a percent of every project. It's a percent of that capital, um, of capital appropriation. And that's, that's partly, coming partly out of the desire from all these other city departments that I was referring to for clarity on how they budget for public art, where those funds come from. Like they want to do it, but they don't have a mechanism in place right now to just sort of say, okay, if we're going to do public art, I can get that part of the funding from over here, and then if I have a, a grant source that allows me to include public art, I can get another bit of funding from over here and start putting together a larger budget. So you're not trying to get a percent from developers? We are not trying to get a percent. A percent some, some cities do that. And I think that it might have even been what the intention was when we talked about this in like 1995 or whenever it was happened last in Burlington. But we are not trying to get a percent for developers, but there will be other incentives written into the policy for um, to encourage developers to um, either participate in public art projects. Um, and part of that will so a lot of this is the, the committee that's working on this in Burlington is um, a. a series of different planners from different departments so they really understand all of the different ways that um, incentives can be put in place based on existing plans within the city so for example the comprehensive planner said well there's a new we just passed um, the uh, um, what do you call it the um, it's the downtown it's basically the downtown plan where um, it, within the downtown area, developers will be required to do certain things in, provide certain amenities in spaces that are public. And so the public art program may offer, may offer them something to do that, which is essentially you know, resources in the city to help, um, help commission that work through these guys. Inclusionary zoning. <coughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about this. Uh, if, in case someone oh. hasn't heard about this. Uh. That doesn't look so good on that. Sorry, that was a little under rest. Um, so um, I, I heard people laughing when I, when I mentioned this mural because obviously it's been in the news a lot and it is a very controversial subject in Burlington. And the question of whether or not the mural should be taken down, uh, if it should be added to, or a new mural should be um, created in Burlington has been uh, the source of a lot of tension, and I think rightly so. 
Um, and then, of course, there's the whole conversation about whether it was a good piece of public art or not a good piece of public art in the first place. And um, to me, it's not as important ever, but in public art in public places, like how amazing the work is. It's re it's really that the, what's the the, the um, strength of this piece has become, no matter what you think of it as a piece of art, the dialogue that we um, have begun to have in public about um, how, not just how we think about race and bias, but also how it um, surfaces in, in art and symbolism every day and things that we look at. Um, and, you know, just as a aside, my personal opinion is that uh, it's a very dangerous road to start tearing down public art once it's in the public, yeah. and whether it's good or it's bad, you can change uh, the story that surrounds that piece of work, but you're really, I, I think it would be a very um, dangerous thing to start um, taking work down rather and, and taking it out of the public eye rather than helping people understand where the controversy is coming from. So, And in this instance, it's around the lack of racial diversity yes that's represented yes lack of racial diversity all I, so the piece was actually commissioned um during the quadricentennial in burlington i'm not sure if you're familiar with that it was like the 400th anniversary of the arrival of samuel de champlain so basically commemorating french culture in um the lake champlain region and so at the time the a lot of the conversation in the, in the quadricentennial was around how how Abenaki cultures were represented in in the arts and festivities of that time and so that to me is uh, <coughs> more of a of an issue in this in this piece uh, there isn't really a representation of Abenaki <coughs> culture and that was a real lost opportunity I mean I would not consider this like unnamed Indian mm -hmm. not even an Abenaki <laughs> um, Appropriate Abenaki attire, um, referencing their culture at all. Yeah. Could you walk us through the commissioning process? Like, mm -hmm. how how did a group of decision makers end up with the mural with that flaw in it? Yeah. Um, so this particular mural is a weird one because <laughs> the Church Street Marketplace. So in our 199, the the policy that we passed in 1999. Um, Burlington City Arts was um, vested by the city council as the department that would manage public art for all city departments. However, the Church Street Marketplace is a weird little loophole because they, by charter, are very separated from the rest of the city and I don't completely understand exactly what the charter says and what they're allowed to do and not to do, but it was put in place essentially so that they could um, really function more like a business running um, a number of business, you know, supporting businesses on Church Street and keeping vitality alive in um, the retail marketplace. So they commissioned this piece on their own, um, and they have always sort of stuck to that idea that they would commission their own work. That Burlington City, they felt Burlington City Arts was a little too edgy for them. Like we were gonna, you know, commission work. But I know it's not. That's not how it works because we don't actually ever pick the artwork. As administrators of um, public art, we use a panel of community members who rep represent the stakeholders and the community and so forth. And they did make an attempt to do that because they asked us, you know, what we thought they should do. And we said you should have a panel of stakeholders. And then they proceeded to put together a panel of like 26 people, which was like totally <laughs> insane. And I don't even know if, who was involved and who wasn't involved. I don't know. He, he actually yeah. counts me as somebody who was on the panel, which I never was on actually on the panel. Um, but most of the stakeholders in this particular mural for from the marketplace places perspective were businesses on Church Street who were right downtown people um, who are funding the mural. There's a whole other conversation there that <laughs> I won't get too deeply into, but. Um, and I think that they had been in Quebec and looking at work like this um, that could be funded through sponsorships, essentially, and that that, that was um, the driver of how this piece was put together. So this 26 person panel, and it, I, I'm sorry, I don't know everybody who was on it. We're, we're, that was not, they were not thinking about um, some of the um, concerns that were 
surfacing in our department around the quadricentennial. We were also at this, we were putting together a $2 million festival at the time. So we were not involved heavily in this and consulting as much as now I wish we had been. Um, <laughs> and uh, that they just, they just didn't, and I will say that at the, when I, when I re-looked at the um, proposal from the artist, it wasn't a proposal where you would have said, oh, this is terrible. Like, this is not, re he did reference, he referenced black history and he referenced, um, he referenced the Abenaki Nation, but just the way that it ended up uh, being expressed didn't, didn't really quite match the proposal. And because it was an, an evolving process, I think, with um, the Church Street Marketplace and who was in and who was not in was a lot based on who was paying to be in. Hey Sarah, in the, time, in the time you've been in Burlington at BCA, how long, how long have you been there? <coughs> I'm kind of embarrassed to talk about this, but it's been, um, I've been there for almost 19 years. Okay, well good, this question is good then. How have you seen the city's relationship to public art change <coughs> as the city has grown in its uh, development of public art? Well, or, um... Or have, has, have you sensed that there's been a change? I think that we are experiencing a change right now. There really wasn't a lot of um, development happening for the period, you know, from like 2005 until really like 2000, you know, 2015, 16, like things have started to really ramp up in Burlington. There's so much going on now all of a sudden. There was like a bottleneck of projects that hadn't happened over the course of the recession and the leadership that was in place for a number of years and so forth and all of a sudden like all those projects are happening and everybody wants public art to be part of them so that's a really different position that we are in like we're actually kind of panicking and thinking like okay uh, so who's gonna run all these projects like how are we gonna fund the, the person that is gonna need to be hired in order to make sure that we can actually manage them manage them well and so part of that percent for art policy is um, <coughs> the intention is to try to figure out some of those financial pieces for the actual admin as well as the um, payment to artists. Um, and you know, in the, in the older days, I call them the older days, they were really they were early days when I first started working for BCA, it was truly like a constant battle in public art to be at, and we were always like, you know, pounding on the doors and saying like, we should be at the table when you're re, designing the College Street traffic circle. That could be so much more interesting um, and a much better learning opportunity for the public about all the stormwater stuff that's happening on the site if you include a public art project. And it was, all, I mean, I spent so many hours like sitting at these tables with these like super boring engineers and <laughs> it was just like <laughs> never the thing that ended up happening. <laughs> um, so that, that, was, that was the truth, that was the way it was for a lot of years and there wasn't, I think because you know, we had a different mayor at that time. There wasn't an interest from, and I love, I've loved all the mayors. It's not a personal thing. They're, they've all been great leaders in their own way, but we didn't really even know how much um, leadership could make a difference in advancing public art until recently. Because when the mayor says, like, you guys are gonna have to put aside $40,000 for a public art piece when that street gets redone, and they all start going like, oh, okay, well, I guess we'll try to figure out how to make that happen, whereas that never happened in the past. And we don't have a mechanism to fund it. And that's why everybody's scrambling around saying, like, hey, can you like come up with a better policy so that we know where to get that forty thousand dollars from in the future? Okay. Yeah. This is a little related, but I'm wondering if being forced to do temporary projects uh -huh. both taught you guys sort of internally how to do it and as well as sort of got the community up to speed too about because when something's permanent, yeah. it has such weight. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if there was a learning process, both internally and for the community, that, that got you to this point where, where now you've got this <coughs> and everybody wants to do it. Yeah, and I, when I say everybody, I'm really talking about my city colleagues yeah. because I don't know, I don't know that I have like an exact temperature on what the public feels, but I do know that a lot of the temporary work that we were, we've done, and like I said in my earlier presentation, um, it was, a, it, it was a great way for us to get money into artists' hands, to get things happening. Whereas with a public art project, it is like, that happens over a really long period of time. It's like building, it's like building a house. So 
um, I think we were able to build a much stronger um, active artist community because there was actually opportunities for them kind of right at their fingertips during those years as opposed to having to wait for the permanent piece to come around or for you know all the controversies that will come inevitably come around permanent public work just don't really happen as much in the temporary realm. I mean not that they don't happen but they come and they go so there's not really something to fight about for too long. You kind of take those conversations home and <laughs> continue to know on them. So you have cards on your desk and a, or on your chair and a pen. Just take a minute to reflect on this question and write it on one of those cards before we go on to our next. Hey, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Gary Savoy and I'm a visual artist and a teaching artist and I'm a founder of an organization called River of Light which brings um, parades and the joy of parades of local communities um, through art making and shared celebration. There's also a large degree of skill sharing and a whole process of um, <clears throat> art making with professional artists and working with community members um, that result in a, a big public celebration. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, the role of parade and procession and temporary public participatory art events um, and how they can exist as really powerful pieces of public art. Um, <clears throat> in order to have a parade or some kind of profession, uh, processional piece, uh, there's probably maybe a year, maybe two years in the process of that coming about. Um, and that's just as an imp important part of that. Uh, procession, but the event itself is very quick. They can last from anything from five minutes to an hour, but they're just packed with this really kind of visceral, exciting audiovisual experience that invites so many different art, art forms and has a whole wealth of entry points. So, for, uh, music, uh, visual art, costume, choreography, puppetry. There is like, there are so many ways in which you can enter this world. And uh, the event itself is ephemeral, and that's the whole point. They're not intended <coughs> to be permanent. They're meant to just last more in the hearts and minds of people and to be able to start a tradition that uh, carries on uh, after the event is over. Thank you, Paul. So <clears throat> participatory public art events really bring attention to public spaces, um, and they redefine how we use them as well. This is a a photo from um, the Romney Memorial School had a lantern parade or quite a few years ago, 2013. And uh, they do not have a space where they can walk in the street. <coughs> the school is like, right on the main road. It's a really dangerous uh, place. There was no way of closing down the road uh, or being able to organize that. So we ended up having a parade in this field, a football field, with a bandstand in it which was a real surprise to everyone who came, including the students, partly because this is a space that is never used during the winter. It's never ploughed, it's just full of snow, it has a bandstand, and come spring, people will use it again. So there was a way in which these spaces can be redefined and used. And it's not just streets can be used, it can be like parking lots and uh, village greens, and we can close the road if we can employ the police to uh, help us out. But that act of empowering people with the ability to use these public spaces is really important. Um, before I'd been to my first parade, which probably happened when I was like in my mid-twenties in England, I'd never actually walked down the middle of a street before, like in the road, where the road had been closed. I know we have a Macy's Fourth of July parade, but that's like a, a very specific occasion. It isn't really about the people as much as the event. So, uh, yeah, you're going to more political demonstrations. So, parade, this is a, one of the finales of, a, of the parade. Um, parades mobilize people from all different walks of life. Uh, and they bring people together, uh, either to the streets, but the, whole, the one thing they have in common is that they unify and they connect people and people are able to have a shared celebration as well. 
So uh, they build bridges between schools and communities, but they also create a sense of ownership and civic pride. And I think this is why there are some really important crossovers with, with public art and how we view that. The vehicle is different, but the end result is the same. So I'm going to talk a bit about the River of Light in Waterbury, uh, which has been happening for eight years now. Um, the last year, was uh, I was doing it for seven years, and now I've carried on the torch to the community who are going to take it forward in the direction that they want to take it in. But it began um, in 2010 as a small school residency. Uh, myself and MK Mon, the art teacher at Thatcher Brook Primary School, uh, began uh, our first parade and it had a community element and an all, every student in the school made a lantern. Um, and after seven years, it's become one of the largest light events in New England. It uh, had a big feature in Yankee magazine and people really do clog up the highway to get to the parade, which is, which is a good sign, I think. Uh, but it is very beloved within the community and most importantly, it started a new tradition. Um, and it's an event that's been building social capital since then. So uh, the funding model has been interesting. At the beginning, we were very reliant on Arts Council funding and money from private foundations. Um, but over the years, that's moved on to a model of local business sponsorship and, um, and support, a sale of merchandise and, uh, and, not, and donations from community members who really want to see this uh, succeed, which has been wonderful. And for the last few years, the parade's been a line item in the school budget. Uh, which has passed, um, thankfully. And uh, we've also seen a real benefit in tourism of Waterbury as well. Um, this is a, an image from a, an event that we had with... Uh, Sorry, did I go too yeah, soon? Did I... did, but it's okay. It's all right, you can go straight over. I just want to show that one. No, yeah. I'm kidding. Yeah, there's some of the artist's lanterns. Um, thank you, Paul. <laughs> so with any kind of participatory art event, um, the people that participate in the process are what? That's the important part of it. There's also a high degree of equity as well, because it really doesn't matter how you participate. You may be on the organizational committee, perhaps you attend a workshop, you're making fairy wings or a lantern, or you're making a drum, it doesn't really matter. Perhaps you're a spectator. But every individual contribution uh, adds to that sense of social cohesion. Um, thank you for the next one, please. Um, this is an image from a refugee festival that happened um, in Manchester where artists, many, many artists, worked with uh, groups all over Manchester uh, to work with refugee groups. I, I worked specifically with the refugee groups, and we had a big festival at the end of it. With, again, it's just a one-day event. Um, but what happens after that one-day event is what's important, because those initial collaborations are then over, and it's how they continue in future years that's important. Um, and it really is about community <coughs> champions taking on that torch and shaping it in a way in which they uh, feel can work with their own community. So the leadership will change and the event will evolve, but the important thing is that it does keep uh, moving forward. So some of these events do not have to be expensive and fantastical. Um, they can be very low-key, local, community-minded, and also topical. Uh, quite often parade and procession has a crossover with social activism um, uh, or protest. Uh, this is an event, the Darn Hill Shop, uh, Shopping Trolley Olympics. It was just the most adorable thing in a very economically deprived area of Manchester. But um, the arts organization orchestrated, orchestrating this employed uh, multiple artists to work with groups all over the region, focusing on different Olympic sports, um, I to a uh, hot air ballooning, <laughs> which is an Olympic sport, and, um, and tennis. But what was important with this is that the students really had a sense of ownership and pride. And they were able to learn about being healthy and having exercise and, uh, and also sharing their work in public. So um, next slide, please, Paul. So uh, participatory art events, I think, really bring people together. And again, I just want to stress that with those crossovers with public art. Uh, they allow people to communicate openly and uh, really to connect in profound ways. Um, how, how many minutes have I got? You're good, you got a couple minutes. Okay, I just wanna read out um, this research that I found incredibly interesting and it was uh, published by 
this think tank in England called the Audience Agency, who worked with multiple um, organizations around the UK. It was several years of research. And they found that our outdoor art, so whether it's parade or procession or kind of meeting in a, in a gathering space, consistently attracts an audience that's representative of the population as a whole. Mm. Now, for me, that was important because it's not about going into a museum or a gallery or a poetry reading, but the understanding is that outdoor art, I'm just going to read these out, <clears throat> has a fewer barriers because there are no strict timings and there's no entrance into buildings. There are social experiences that exist as entertainment only for the most part. Uh, people have the ability to roam in and out and come and go as they please without intimidation or fear of uh, having to explain how they feel about the artwork. And they are fully in control of their own experience um, and their own level of engagement is, is up to them, so they have autonomy over that. And the audiences are generally overwhelmingly local, so 70% of people come from a 20 mile radius. Uh, and there is an expectation that the experience will be surprising, different, and of a high quality. So I thought that was uh, pretty interesting stuff. Anyway, that's the end of my little spiel. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Questions or thoughts? Any questions oh, for Gavin? I have a question. Yeah. I've found it difficult um, in galvanizing busy parents <coughs> and families um, around uh, our projects, and I was wondering how you did that, um, not only within the community, but it sounds like you have um, more than just one town participating. Right, um, yeah, and that's, it's always a struggle to do that, and I think it's a struggle um, because if we're talking about parents in school, uh, schools tend to make excuses for reasons why parents can't do this. But they're so busy, we can't ask them, we can't ask them to do anything else. But I found a few... Um, incorporate, allow parents to participate in the whole process rather than telling them what you want or telling them what to do. Um, they feel a little more sense of empowerment and ownership over the event as much as the students. And I've, this was particularly uh, poignant when I worked in Montpelier a few years ago when we had a, a parade here, um, <coughs> was that the more that we asked parents to come and just be part of this process and turned it into a more of a social event where they could meet other parents and work together and take responsibility for creating something of their own. So in this event case it was like building poles or testing lights. Um, they really kind of embraced it and it became quite a social occasion and people just tended to come and just have some coffee or make it about pizza, you know, and um, just turn it into a social thing. So having a um, uh, kind of spreadsheets that go out or doodle polls or just inviting people to sign up and then turn it into something more uh, fun has almost always worked. So like, We've never had problems with people not signing up uh, across the community. So. But it is difficult. It's how I think we frame it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how would you say in Waterbury, uh, how many of us have been to the Waterbury Parade? Anybody in here been to the Waterbury Parade? They closed down both streets. Literally, what, like 2,000 people paraded last year? Yeah. Yeah, they, had to, they were so big, they had to start uh, on, on both sides and converge in the middle, in the intersection. And over the seven years or so, how would you characterize the way the community's uh, idea about the parade has changed and, it's, and therefore its participation? Because it started with just a little funding and now it's kind of ongoing. It is, yeah, it is ongoing. And the town wants to pay for it because it's paying for itself. Um, there's a lot of increased business for restaurants and bars. Um, they've noticed a peak in tourism around that weekend as well. So it's on the same weekend. Well, it's interesting. I think every community has been the same where at the beginning, we're unfamiliar with the concept. We don't know what's going to happen. People are resistant. We don't know what this is. I don't think we like it. Um, there is resistance from everybody, and uh, but once they experience it, it has to be experienced. Like it's not something that can be seen on television. That's the whole point of public art that you have to be present in that environment. Um, and once people experienced it and they realised the benefits of it and how it brought people together and how much joy it created, um, that started to change over the years. And the thing with the streets was really. Um, a significant part of that because the first year 
we asked the police to shut the streets and the policeman sat in his car and ate a donut and didn't do anything and we had to walk on the sidewalk in a in a whiteout. I mean it was, it was crazy and then the next year we did realize that maybe you make a donation to the police and that helps a lot and then after that second year we've never had they're more than willing to participate so it really it's slow baby steps um, yeah um, how big is your is your team usually for for facilitating or running a project like this? Yeah, that's has, it, has it grown and, and or what's the kind of media uh, team? Um, so I do not take a team of people in, which I could. You know, I could take artists in. Um, sometimes my husband is he's a sculptor as well, so we'll teach the artists workshops to build these larger scale pieces purely because it's just easier with two of us. Um, but for the most part, I try not to have a team because I don't want it to be... Um, the model, I think, I'm trying to make it a little bit different about having, allowing communities to have autonomy over it because I can employ artists and take them in, but that's not teaching anybody about how to do it themselves. So what I offer is that I will teach you how to do it for yourself. So we'll have artist workshops and teachers workshops and we'll invite community members to learn how to build and how to um, orchestrate the parade. But in terms of a school recommendation or a community recommendation, I'd say maybe four or five people on a team so they can uh, delegate the marketing and the materials and, um, and then I will teach people how to build the lanterns so they can then go work with that community. Um, and that way they have the skills to take it forward. Yeah. So no help with the, the night of or keeping things It's all about of, volunteers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a lot. Yeah. As <laughs> more the merrier. Yeah. Um, and, and it goes back to that <coughs> same thing about engaging people. Like people want to help because they realize it's their event for themselves. And that's the difference with just taking people in and providing the entertainment. Gallery. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering about your experience with really small communities. Do you have any experiences with really tiny towns? And <clears throat> yeah, how did it look? What? It's just gorgeous. It's just <laughs> it's just magic. If in fact it's even more magical, because there's this kind of ragtag kind of parade of people, <laughs> but it's everyone from the town. Um, when I worked in uh, St Stratford um, a few years ago very small community. We still had a community workshop and a school residency. Because um, that's something else that's very important to me is keep this community element. Um, it was just very sweet and small and they kept it going for a few years and you know, maybe they'll revisit it in years to come. But yeah, it works well. My question was about the, the themes or if you have any <coughs> particular themes. I assume when you started in Waterbury that it was probably related to the curriculum or somehow something they were studying in the school or not? And um, how has that evolved as you've kind of let the community? It was a tenuous uh, link that first year. <laughs> 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 it, it, I think it because there had to be a link. Right? Yeah, um, yeah. And, and it worked well because we were looking, they were studying Brazil and uh, the art and music of Brazil. So we were bringing in Brazilian beats and looking at some of the artwork and so there was a connection there but I think in terms of um, very topical social issues work really well because it gives students an opportunity to research not only students it gives people an opportunity to think about uh, subjects that are ongoing in our, in our environment right now so anything to do with the environment or nature are always very popular but there's generally some link with the curriculum um, but not quite so arts integrated. Yeah. Yeah. But you but you worked with MK to, yes. to like have the classes coordinate and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's pretty brilliant to have the kids creating the work throughout the whole semester or whatever. Yeah, um, they. I think MK works with some of the grade, but she was working with um, some of the grades in the weeks up to the point where I would come in and work with uh, some of the older students. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, they were primed and ready <laughs> for when I came in. And then of course they have lanterns afterwards. Um, and I think what's really poignant about that is that I think two years ago, 
um, the students who had moved on to middle school had had this event in their psyche since they were in preschool. So they had done this. It had been present in their lives, this idea of a community arts project that's really kind of important to them since they could remember. So hopefully they're going to take that forward you know, and uh, take some responsibility for making it happen. Okay, we're going to ask you to take a look at this question. And after you've filled out a different card, you'll see this table over on the side has these questions. Uh, set your cards out on the table, and then we'll come back for Lars. My name's Lars, and um, I'm an artist, educator, agitator. Uh, really quickly here in 10 minutes. One is provide a brief introduction to the work that I've done and how that informs my view of public art. Uh, second, offer a couple of examples. Here's one already, and we'll get to those. Um, talk a little bit about what I think unites them as public art, and then um, get to this question of, um, sort of, what did you call them, a provocative question? or a Challenge question. Challenge question. <laughs> um, so my, my artistic coming of age, if you will, happened in Washington, D.C. Uh, I was a photographer there. I worked with um, young people on a project called Shooting Back. And our goal with Shooting Back was to uh, teach kids who were at risk, low income, how to use a camera. And the purpose for how to use a camera was twofold. One is it's functional. Teach a skill, you can use that later in your life, we hope. The second was to create voice and agency in their lives. To be able to tell the story of being homeless, of living in a shelter, whatever that was, get it out into the public discourse in Washington, D.C. We found that lawyers' offices were the best place to do that because they had long halls with very bad art. So what we ended up doing is putting these young people's uh, artwork um, that they had produced over the period of you know six months in their lives up on those walls. We would organize a reception where the muckety mucks and everybody would come together, and the young people would be talking to them in a gallery context about what these images reflected from their lives. So that was one example of sort of art as advocacy and agency for young people. Uh, the second piece, um, we founded this as a group of artists in DC, you know, you do this when you're young, found an organization. Uh, so we founded um, something called the Center for Collaborative Art and Visual Education. It was a gallery in downtown Washington, but we also did a lot of outreach programs. And one of those programs was to look at vacant and deteriorating buildings in the city because at the time, the downtown core was kind of being lost as the sort of outer part of the city was being developed. David will probably know what that looked like. Um, so we, what we would do is we would propose to the developer, the owner of that building, to go in, clean it up, activate the space, make it look pretty and attractive, <laughs> um, but at the same time host public art shows. What we chose to do was uh, use sound and dance. So uh, what we would do is gather some of the sounds that we heard in the building, create a score around it, install that, have a big opening, um, and really sort of bring a sense of life um, and uh, delight to buildings that were otherwise really a mark uh, against the city. Um, this was important, I think, because it positioned us as artists, as partners with developers. Um, so the third story I want to uh, share uh, happened after I moved up here to Vermont, which was um, using a collage process to uh, tell stories from young people who were impacted by HIV and AIDS um, again, as self-advocacy and um, as agency, to be able to advocate for the change that they needed to survive. So what we did with this Global Peace Tiles project is uh, fostered workshops around the world, from Uganda to um, Brazil, uh, from uh, here in Vermont we did some workshops, to uh, places in Europe. Um, all these workshops were happening led by educators, a lot like Gallery, working in schools, community centers, uh, remote Ugandan villages, um, and then we were able to um, get a number of those uh, selected uh, from every community, and we would assemble large-scale murals uh, with those individual works. What we did, because we were dealing with the issue of HIV and AIDS, was install them uh, where AIDS policymakers worked. So we got a mural uh, installed uh, at the uh, Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria in Geneva. Um, we got it in the boardroom as well, a second one in the boardroom, when they had their um, sort of global annual meeting uh, in Tunisia. Uh, so again, 
with this idea of inserting young people's voices into the lives of people with authority and power to make decisions over their lives. Uh, so those are three uh, examples of sort of art in public spaces, but really from an advocate perspective, right, the artist agitator. That's not all that public art is, right? I recognize that there's this bigger discourse um, around delight and function and form in public spaces. So I wanted to offer uh, four examples that I think are really different, but still help us think about public art as impactful in our lives in meaningful ways. So has anybody been to Chicago and seen what they call the bean, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it's cloud map, maybe, is what Anish Kapoor calls it. Um, I love this piece because it transforms how we see the world around us, right? It really gives us um, an entirely new perspective, but with this central focusing, I mean, it brings people together, which is one of the great functions, I think, um, of public art. Freeway Park in Seattle, anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, it was built in the 70s, wonderful, who's the architect? Who's Lawrence Halpern. Thank you, Lawrence Halpern. Um, the guy who also did the Roosevelt Memorial in Washington, D.C. But um, it's a fantastic piece of public art as landscape art. And the idea here is that um, public art transforms the landscape, right? It can become a place that, again, brings people together. I mean, every summer you go there, there are kids of all different backgrounds, their parents hanging out, enjoying both the green, the concrete, and then the flowing water that courses throughout this environment. It's wonderful. Okay, so um, this one um, I like because uh, it's a very simple piece of public art, sort of like the pocket parks that you've seen Ward Joyce putting up around here. Um, but actually, go to the other one first, so I'm trying to create a narrative. Yes, Brooklyn. Back to Brooklyn. <coughs> okay, so here's the um, here's a great example of public art. Very simple murals. You know, it's one of the lowest common denominator forms of getting public art out there. But with technology today. Uh, we can really turn that public art into delightful play and share it. Um, communicate a brand if that's what you're about. Share your city if that's what you're about. Um, but I think the idea of connecting public art to how we engage each other today is kind of a new and exciting territory. Okay, so now we can go back to... That's um, a hilarious piece. <laughs> that, that, that's in Brooklyn. Yeah, that's Tinder. If you guys know what Tinder is, it's a dating app. Um, so very clever. So not that one, but the floating... Yes. So this is the idea of... Uh, public art that can nourish us, not just spiritually or in our souls, but actually uh, from a, a nutritional perspective. Um, more and more we're seeing um, vertical walls, um, uh, growing things, living things being used um, as public art. Okay, now we can go to the last one. Um, is, that, is that Berlin? Uh, it's, it's, it's not. It's, um, I want to say Utrecht, but it's not Utrecht. Um, it's a small town in Amsterdam. Um, Okay, so Arco Santi, the entire city as a work of public art, right? So Arco Santi is a visionary sort of community in the desert in Arizona, founded in the 70s. Um, going to a couple of themes that I heard um, tonight, you know, one of the things that organizes this visionary city, which is built, I think maybe about 1,200 people live there now, um, is this idea of a river, um, and then of course green things uh, growing within it. But the river is the central theme for the entire city, um, in the sense that people can sort of move through it in a very water-like fashion. A lot of public gathering spaces, a lot of green spaces, and spaces where art is installed throughout this city. Um, and so I wanted to offer that there because the city can be a platform for public art and for art engagement. Um, and so that's one of the things that um, I hope we can bring to this conversation is, how is Montpelier a platform for public arts engagement, whether that's that temporary artwork, that's advocacy-oriented, advocacy activist-oriented, play-oriented, um, people-oriented in the sense of um, wonderful parades, but then also how can it be that space for monumental, lasting, intergenerational public art? Uh, so I think that's all I got. Is the question at the end of this? It is, okay. but do we want to uh, large, I mean, you, uh, Introduce yourself as a provocateur a little bit, I think. I can't remember if you used that exact word. But agitator. local, you know, agitator, yeah. And your work with Local 64 and bringing people together into infrastructure, you know, to share space. Uh, just talk a little bit about um, your experience and the challenge of that and the way it's been transformational here in Montpelier because you bring art into that space and bring people into that space around art. Um, so I'll, I'll speak to the transformational part because I think it's very short. If it's been transformational, I'm 
glad to hear it because you know too often we're just doing the day-to-day month-to-month week-to-week thing or year-to-year thing um, and there's it doesn't uh, feel in the day-to-day particularly transformational right uh, but we do do art shows on first Friday and we bring people in fairly sort of um, bread and butter stuff for a public space what we'd like to do is more things like what we did with Norwich University when their students crafted um, some very exciting visions for what we could be doing with what is now a pocket park created by Ward Joyce next to the old country store where that burned down. Mm -hmm. So there's a vacant space there. Um, We invited Norwich University students to envision what that space could look like if we um, sort of adapted our eyes and our aesthetic to a more modern architectural vernacular. Um, And so we did use it as a space for real public engagement in in that. It takes, takes a fair amount of work and we haven't done enough of it. We'd certainly love to do more, uh, very sort of by hook by crook. I'm going like this, but I mean hook and by crook. How long? Oh, baby, baby steps. Baby oh, steps. Karen's yeah. going to be joining us, and she's going to blow it open. So yeah. that'll be good. No, I don't do anything small. Yeah. What was the timing timing arc on the pocket park? How long from like a concept to you know creation? Uh, I think the fundraising piece was the longest piece. I mean, Ward worked uh, with I think. The develop the property owner to, to clear the runway, um, and I think you know the developer is very open to this kind of thing, which I, in my experience has been true. Um, and then uh, worked with I think Vermont Technical College students at the time to design some things, um, and then of course you had to raise the funds, you know, to get their nine thousand or whatever it was to build it. And I would say all total maybe it was eight months or something like that, um, and then it comes in and out every year now. The second one, the larger one, I don't know. The one I was talking about earlier is the one that usually hangs out in front of Capitol Grounds, um, which kind of comes and goes seasonally uh, to free up that that parking spot and get out of the snow mitigation. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, Ward would be a great uh, person to have in this conversation because he's probably done more with his one, two, three, four pocket parks now to turn us in probably the pocket park capital of the country. <laughs> yeah, there's one coming to Randolph this summer as well. Of, of his as well? Yeah, Fantastic. Yeah, That's great to hear. And the VTC students. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and it's VTC students mm-hmm. too. Right. Good. Yeah. Love it. Any so questions? City is platform. That's my concept. City is platform. Huh. Any thoughts for Lars before we go to his question? You want to give that one to us, Lars? Sure. What infrastructure is required to establish uh, accessible, uh, inclusive, and transparent public art planning uh, over time? Especially, and you know, this is my bias, for youth and working artists. Um, and when I t- talk about infrastructure, it's both the spaces and places, but also the decision-making processes. Okay. I want to open it up for any general questions for any of the presenters that we've had tonight for Paul about the process. How far, um, oh, excuse me. Yeah, how ahead. far along are you? And is, is, is there anything already in, in the works for my program? And so we're in kind of, um, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, let me see how I can uh, characterize this. So there are three big, there, there are two big chunks to the process. Uh, one is, or three big chunks. One is the, these, all these sessions where we're gathering information and we're coming to the end of this kind of public workshop phase. So this started back in the early fall. And we're entering into the kind of brass tacks of writing the policy. And also we've been having meetings with city government and counselors, uh, great to see Donna here, and she's been really engaged uh, in the process, learning about it, and understanding what that governance structure might look like. So when we have funding, who's going to manage it? Uh, I think uh, you know Sarah's speaking to that. It was certainly, the challenge that is, is involved. You can't just throw money out there and not have a process. Uh, so that's the second phase: is actually writing the plan. What are we going to be proposing to city council to adopt? And then there was another uh, phase that, that Sean was involved in and some other artists where we actually commissioned a $50,000 work of art that will be installed at the One Taylor Street project when it's finished in the summer of 19. And we just awarded that commission after a, a several month process, uh, 23 applicants and uh, Gregory Gomez and Rodrigo Nava will be creating a work to be installed 
outside of the transit center on the porch underneath the balcony facing the river. And um, we're getting some images from them to refine what, and share that with everybody. But So that one's done. This one is almost done. And now we're moving into the final policy writing phase. And what was your just if anyone had any questions for <laughs> yeah um, so what are what are some ways that um, artists might be able to get involved in the more um, preliminary or administrative side of things or the more what, what are the kind of soft skills uh, required for um, being a part of uh, the, the other end of the art making. Um, does, that, does that make sense? Are you sense? talking about the, in the planning phases yeah. of, a, of a construction project? Or in, I'm curious what your, yeah, um, where you want to dive into it. Well, if, there's, if like, there's like the, I mean, I'm trying to understand all of it. But I mean, there's, there's the creation part of it. And then there's a lot of things that happen beforehand. Yeah. So yeah. I guess I'm trying to identify opportunities or or ways of getting involved in the the beginning of it, um, you know, aside from coming up with my own idea and starting a, yeah. my own festival right. or something. Well, I think, and, and Sarah, please jump in if you have any suggestions here, too. But I think if you think about public art as a whole spectrum, there's the $50,000 or $250,000 permanent public art type, <coughs> very formal process uh, for a permanent piece of work. Everything from that all the way down to the low cost, no cost, temporary, it's happening in a weekend, let's get together and do something to engage with one another type of project. And then within that spectrum, there's also various points within any kind of community planning process, whether it's for a building or a bridge or a anything, really, <laughs> where there's visioning that happens. So how can artists get involved with the visioning and thinking about what do I value about my community, posing questions, thinking about that. <clears throat> There's also, then once you know, okay, we're going to put a building here, what are the ways that an artist can in, get involved in thinking about what's it going to look like, what's it going to feel like, how do we want people in, to interact with it, working collaboratively with maybe a design team and the architect. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the actual creating of the work. And then once you've created the space, all the way up to activating that space after it's built and keeping things and programming and going in there. So I think if you just keep thinking broadly, and Paul too, just uh, you know, with the pu public art plan that they're creating and your policies and things like that, I think the idea is to be wide open to lots of ways and places that people can engage. Is that right? right? And we're actually writing into the policies specifically, I think, Sean, what you're talking about is so that artists can have uh, it can be articulated an artist role in development that they connect with the architect early on and the planners to give ideas and and input into what's possible because without that artistic input, of course, it just they just go on and do the same old same old. I was just curious, um, sort of in this planning process, maybe where the other points are. I mean, as you start writing it, where are the points where people can come back and see what you've done so far? comment on it, sort of review whether or not some of the things that you care about are going to be um, supported through whatever the policy is. Like, you know, it's always helpful to kind of get, that's I think a place where it might be helpful to, as an artist, to mm -hmm. see what a policy is going to do to create opportunities mm -hmm. for you down the road. Yeah, and I know it's, it's kind of a vague or, or hard question to answer, but it, um, you know, I'm, I'm very aware of calls to artists and and those kinds of opportunities and ways to apply to make art, but I, um, it's kind of a mystery to me how to how one comes to the other side and is maybe like on a panel or writing the call, a committee or writing a call or 
the grant that gets the money for the art, or you know. Like and yeah. so and so yeah. those those uh, you know. Like in this instance with Art Synergy, we had calls to the community to volunteer for the, the artist advisory team and then also for designing the RFQ and serving on the artist selection committee. And so that was in the fall? Or? Yeah, that was all in the fall. And um, we did, I mean, of course, the challenge is getting the word out and getting every, you know, everybody saturated with the fact that this is going on. And since this is new, this first time, it's harder. And as it becomes established, people will know where to go for that information. But right now, that information was on Facebook pages and Montpelier Live. But in the future, as this becomes established each year, uh, people will know to uh, the calls going out at you know this time of the year or whatever. So I think that'll be easier for our community going forward. What about Paul? The possibility of putting artists on your board or on an advisory committee that is sort of more closely connected to those decision channels. I don't know if that's what sort of you're asking for, but, you know, other than um, sort of subscribing to all the email lists and trying to show up when everybody says jump, are there ways to pull artists into the heart of the process? Sure, and I, I uh, just so everybody knows, the Art Synergy Project will go away. Uh -huh. And and a, a formal governing body will be established to go forward. And those the selection of those individuals will be, I think, what you're talking about, Lars. You know, uh, having people uh, that will be identified or volunteered and selected to serve in some way. And I, again, I'm not sure exactly what that governance structure is going to be yet. But that's a, a way for the community and artists to be involved in the process and serve for a certain amount of time and rotate or, and have different people involved. Great. Yeah. Dominique? I've heard um, through creative uh, network zone meetings this, the, the idea of bringing artists to the table when there are development opportunities <coughs> and working that into kind of the, the common mechanism that happens with this. And <coughs> I was thinking that it would be really great to have, you know, maybe it's the local art organization, of course that's what I'm thinking everywhere else. or maybe it's another thing where they're the the conduit the channel <coughs> for getting the word out to schools they find out you know connecting with the town the town goes to the art organization the art organization connects with the schools or the whatever it is with the artists um, puts the word out and has you know a forum of sorts like the a developer wants to incorporate you know this specific thing they have this criteria could we throw it out there for some creative uh, thinking. So it's not just one artist or a, a few artists that are contributing to that conversation, but you really get more of a, uh, a diverse, uh, creative uh, feedback. For yeah, the project. And absolutely. And it seems like that that could be something that would work. Yeah, and, and we're jealous of River Arts here in Montpelier, <laughs> and we're jealous of Catamount Arts, and we're jealous of of mm -hmm. studio place arts. You know, we don't have that kind of organization in Montpelier. We're working on it, yeah. We're working on it, yeah. <laughs> uh, Center for Arts and Learning, you know, uh, yeah. So absolutely, I think that that's part of the evolution, hopefully, that this project can inspire for Montpelier to have that kind of a group. Paul, will there be opportunities as Amanda do, does these drafts of the policies for people to see those initial drafts and comment on them? Mm -hmm. We're, yes, we'll have them up on the, the um, Art Synergy page, which is Montpelier Alive slash Art Synergy. And if you haven't gotten a card, I'll take this moment to push this out. There is a survey that we would love for everybody to take. We have about 200 people have taken it so far. And if you haven't gotten a card, please see me. I think pass them around. Uh, so just go to MontpelierAlive.com slash Art Synergy, and the survey link is right there. And we'll be posting stuff there, and yeah. yeah. So it's almost 8 o'clock. I know we're almost out of time here. We've got a couple more minutes. But um, before I just ask if there's any last question, I know, Paul, um, if there are things that you'd like to share, comments, things like that, I'm sure there are some extra yellow cards or, or <laughs> cards around here. You can leave them on the table for Paul to collect if we don't get a chance to verbal, verbally express them here now, um, I'm sure. <coughs> It would take Thanks. any thinking or thoughts that you have about this process or ways that you want to be involved. So 
them. Yes, and if you're not on the ma if you'd like to be on the mailing list, just write your email on the card, this last card, and I'll add you to the mailing list. Otherwise, uh, follow Art Synergy Project on Facebook is one way to keep in touch with happenings, and we'll be posting all kinds of things there as we have been. Is there any, any last questions or comments? I was personally curious about who was here in the room, like what kind of mix of um, citizens and decision makers decided to come. I'm, I'm not asking everyone to give a bio or anything, but maybe one of you might have a sense of that, just out of curiosity. Well, how many, stand up if you are involved in art making. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, let's see. What's our next question? Uh, stand up if you have, or stay standing. No, stay standing. State of those art makers, stay standing if you have been involved in the production of somebody else's art or advancing art other than your own. Stay standing. If you've advanced someone else's art other than your own, we have a we have a group full Does of. Does that allow us to stand if we're not already? Oh yeah, stand standing. Stand if you stand. Good point. Good point. Okay. That's what we do. Okay, everybody. Class sit. Thank you, class. So you know, I, it's really interesting that uh, I mean, you know, we're preaching to the choir here in, to one big degree, but we all come from different backgrounds. But we've got a lot of artists in the room. And uh, we've got a city councilor. We've got an executive director of River Arts. Uh, I, I have a question. I'm wondering how many people um, live in Montpelier. Because I'm Hand if you live in Montpelier. Okay. Yeah. My, um, my daughter and I are here. We live in Chelsea. Mm -hmm. And we're actually in the process of doing a mature we live in a valley that's rich with, we're, we're both artists, but we um, are in a valley that's rich with just incredible, incredible number of our sculptors, painters, glass blowers, and there's no unifying organization. Mm -hmm. And um, if you know anything about Chelsea, it's isolated. It's isolated, it's not on the way to any place. Yeah. So, which is a nice thing, in some ways, especially if you live on Main Street. But the um, <clears throat> the idea of you know what's exciting for us is to see the investment, on, obviously on a much larger scale. I'm hearing about what's happening in Burlington, but wanting to take some of these ideas and think about how we might consider our small community and and how we can create some unifying arts events. Um, we're, we're really at the very beginning. I put, you know, Front Porch Forum has been great, but it only reaches the people who are on Front Porch Forum. Um, and we have a lot of older residents who don't use technology at all. So how do we get out to bring people in? Yeah. And, um, and we're very, very excited because the response has been tremendous. Yeah. Uh, and, and starting with, you know, food is our, it's how we bring, <laughs> we brought 90 people together mm -hmm. in January to begin the conversation, and it was really encouraging. So um, we're going to be keeping an ear to what you're doing and, um, and paying attention. Very inspiring. And it's extremely <laughs> inspiring. And listening to, you know, I've never even thought about a parade as a public, I mean, I've, I've attended and participated, but... I never thought of it as a, um, a unifying arts event, and it's it's another really uh, wonderful way to consider how we can get people out into our world. Well, one of the, one of the great truisms <coughs> of Gallery's work and, and teaching artists' work is that when people make something they care about, they're invested, and they have ownership in, in a way that you can't build any other. And so that ability to to drive intrinsic motivation in a project, to get people wanting to invest in it. If you can get them making something, whatever that is, they'll be invested. And that's the, one of the core powers of, of participatory art. So thank you for being Sure, this. thanks. <laughs> thanks everybody, and I want to thank our speakers, and Michelle, and Ginny, and Adam. Please place your last cards over in the section over there.